So I want to talk about the black power movement very, very quickly. Uh, every generation writes its own history uh, for the reason that it sees the past in the foreshortened perspective of its own experience. That's John Hope Franklin and Abraham um, Eisenstein. Uh, what was the black power movement? Um, instead of young people singing, we shall overcome, new images of militant black men and women were being shown on television. Black berets raised fists, men with guns, and women. And along with goals of social justice and integration came ideas of black separatism and power harking back to the black nationalism that had been preached in the 1920s by Marcus Garvey. Revising history, James Baldwin, the world changes according to the way people see it, and if you, if you alter, even by a millimeter, the way people look at reality, then you can change it. Uh, Jacqueline Dowd Hall about the Civil Rights Movement, by confining the civil rights struggles to the South to a single halcyon decade and to limited non-economic objectives, the master narrative simultaneously elevates and diminishes the movement. It ensures the status of the classical phase of the movement, what I call the heroic period, 1954 to 65, as a triumphal mo movement in a larger American progress narrative, yet it undermines its gravitas. It prevents one of the most remarkable mass movements in American history from speaking effectively to the challenges of our time. We think about the 1960s and the iconography, everything from Mexico City, 1968, campus protest, and Vietnam. The heroic period of the civil rights movement, really 1954 to 65, the standard interpretation really just looks at King, Rosa Parks, doesn't look at this as a mass movement. Standard interpretation doesn't want to talk about Malcolm X and black radicals who pushed for a radical democratic movement that was local, national, and global. When we think about the local, national, and global, uniting of black people, development of black economic power, heightened consciousness of black identity, but a movement that was race specific, but also universal simultaneously. Meredith March Against Fear, Stokely Carmichael. No man can give anybody his freedom. Stokely Carmichael in 1966 was America's leading anti-war protester, even more so than Martin Luther King. When we think about historical fingerprints, Crossover, core, bifurcation, ridge, e ridge ending, island, uh, delta, poor. We're trying to find out through um, really forensic measures what happened. We think about Dr. King, the radical king of 65, 66, 67, 68. Power is not the white man's birthright. It will not be legislated for us and delivered in neat government packages. It is a social force any group can utilize by accumulation. It's by accumulation, it's elements in a plan deliberate campaign to organize it under its own control. Black power is a migration story that goes all the way back to the early 20th century. When we think about the raisin, a raisin in the sun, a raisin in the sun is, a, is drawn from Langston Hughes' very famous poem, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it, rot, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? Langston Hughes is talking about race and democracy. Soul on Ice, migration to incarceration. So there's black power, the southern diaspora, and the carceral state. A carceral state is a state modeled on a prison. It is a form or, or a prerequisite to evolution upon a police state. A carceral state is one that seeks to know everything about its inhabitants and visitors, but hides everything about itself. In the United States, we currently warehouse some two million people. When we think about black power and its long durée, the development of black economic power, Richmond, Virginia, December 6, black power, black power, how will he use it in terms of voting rights? We think about the internationalism of the Bandung Conference, but I want to get to Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, the Black Panthers. Government repression, J. Edgar Hoover, and the silencing of democratic uh, uh, discourse in the 1960s. We think about the 1980s and the 1990s. Education, radical democracy and education of the 1960s tried to teach black people about history in alternative ways. Legacy of the Black Panther Party. Was Thomas Jefferson a Black Panther? The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. When we think about Thomas Jefferson and the Black Panthers, I want to end on this. Seize the time. 
Um, ideas. All human beings are created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights. Governments are established to protect the rights of citizens. The right to work the land is a fundamental human right. Consequently, a state that allows private ownership of land must provide employment to those who do not have such property. Freedom of religion should be absolute, and citizens should not be taxed for the support of religious institutions. Universal education is the most effective means of preserving democracy and good government. Uh, the Black Panther Party um, and its 10-point program. We want freedom. Uh, we want the power, the power to determine, determine our own destiny. Uh, we believe that the black community will not be free until we are able to determine our destiny. Number two, we want full employment for our people. Uh, in a way, this is very similar to Jeffersonian uh, principles. We believe that federal government is responsible and obligated to give every man employment or a guaranteed income. We believe that if the white American businessman will not give full employment, then the means of production should be taken from the businessman and placed in the community so that the people of the community can organize and employ all of its people and give a high standard of living. Four, we want decent housing fit for shelter of human beings. Uh, we believe that if the white landlords would not give decent housing to our black community, then the housing and the land should be made into cooperatives so that our community with government aid can build and make decent housing for its people. And then, this is only really just a few points in the 10-point program, we want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. In the last three minutes, what's so interesting about studying um, black radicalism and uh, a, a different definition of American democracy, radical democracy, small d democracy, see that even the Black Panther Party ends their 10-point program uh, in a flourish, uh, demanding land, peace, bread, and justice, but also quoting from the Declaration of Independence. So the Panthers styled themselves as radical socialists, black Marxists, yet at the same time, they had one foot in, in uh, a radicalized vision um, that the founding fathers had articulated at the founding of the republic. So it's interesting, when we think about somebody like Stokely Carmichael, um, I'm writing a biography of Stokely Carmichael right now. Stokely Carmichael uh, is one of the few Americans in the 1960s who actually bleeds for small d democracy. He's arrested at 19 years old uh, in Mississippi as a freedom rider. Uh, Carmichael is arrested 27 times between 1961 and 1966, and in the New Republic in January of 1966, defines small d democracy as a concept that is best etched in the faces of black sharecroppers in the Mississippi Delta and in the black belt of Lowndes County, Alabama. These are black folks who did not have birth certificates, would never have death certificates, would never learn to read or write, and he said they were at the vanguard for American democracy. So when we think about this notion of a black power movement, we don't think about something that fits outside of American democratic traditions. We think about something that's actually rooted in the core of the founding precepts of the United States. And when we fast forward from black power to Barack Obama, especially in the 21st century, we're, we're living in a, con a time period where people talk about uh, tea parties, where we talk about um, the president is from Kenya, where we, we try to otherize um, a, a, an American citizen who happens to be of black and biracial descent who's, who's leader of the free world. What this shows us is that our discourses on democracy have not necessarily evolved in a linear fashion. In a way, we talked about democracy in a much more robust way in this country in the 1960s and the 1970s than we do now. So the concept that I want to leave you with, with one minute left, is that when we think about this notion of American democracy, the, 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 the heirs of this notion are not just, not only white males, but it's not just found in traditional social protests. It's not just Martin Luther King Jr., but it's also Malcolm X. And even the Dr. King that we all praise, and we lavish so much praise on King, and we just commemorated the 43rd anniversary of the assassination, April 4th, even Dr. King is one of the most eloquent proponents of radical democracy in the late 1960s. By 1968, when King is talking about the fierce urgency of now, the same thing that Senator Barack Obama is going to talk about in 2008, the fierce urgency of now, King is saying the fierce urgency of now is because of militarism, materialism, and racism, the triple threats to humanity. King is the most radical, radically democratic 
active citizen that we've produced in the 20th century because he understood that the roots of the founding of the republic are in precepts of small d democracy that urge social, political, economic transformation of the democratic institutions in this society. Thank you.